words of joy and hope. 19th Sunday Ordinary Time, Year A, Gospel of Matthew, Chapter 14, Verses 22-33 Commentary of Father Fernando Armelini A good Sunday to all. We recall that last Sunday Jesus made his proposal to us to create a new world. And this proposal was presented by the evangelist Matthew not with reasoning but with the story of the sharing of the loaves. The crowd had placed in Jesus' hands everything they had and that food was distributed according to God's criteria of sharing. And it turned out to be not only sufficient, but overabundant. We also note that nothing is said about the remaining fish. Why? Did the evangelist perhaps forget to mention it? No. The evangelist wanted us to focus our attention on the bread because the intention is for us to understand the meaning of the Eucharistic celebration. We remember that all the gestures, the words with which Jesus had made his proposal on this occasion, are again mentioned on the night of the Last Supper. In fact, the Eucharistic celebration celebrates this exchange. It presents us with the proposal of the life that Jesus makes, of his life that has become bread. And he asks his disciples to assimilate his story of surrendered life. This is the real celebration. Jesus remained as bread with us and on the Lord's day we are invited to unite our lives with the life of Jesus. But there is a danger that this Eucharist will continue to be a right and even become a lie, as in the case of Corinth. Paul writing to the Corinthians says, Your gatherings are no longer the supper of the Lord, for each one eats at once his own bread, and while one is hungry, the other is getting drunk. And then they celebrate the Eucharist? This Eucharist is a lie. That bread that was left over filled 12 baskets. The number 12 clearly indicates a basket for each disciple. What did the disciples do with that bread? Where did it end? They clearly took that bread with them. They, and today we have to accompany those 12 to see where they had taken that bread, where they take that proposal of a new world which is born from the sharing of goods. Now let us see what order Jesus gives these disciples. After he had fed the people, Jesus made the disciple get into a boat and proceed him to the other side. While he dismissed the crowds, after doing so, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When it was evening, he was there alone. To understand the message of this passage, we must consider the situation in which it was written. We are towards the end of the first century. Fifty-five years have passed since the death of Jesus and the Christian communities are su suffering. They fight in the midst of many difficulties. The pagan world, in the midst of which they live, is hostile. They persecute them. They also have opposition from the Jewish community. But above all are the internal divisions. Why? The Acts of the, Acts of the Apostles tell us that many Pharisees had converted to Christ, but were still Pharisees, from firm in their traditionalist positions. It is difficult to convert a Pharisee. They were reluctant to accept the great news of the gospel, that is, to the announcement of the unconditional love of God for each person. 
they stubbornly continued to believe that the blessings promised by God to Abraham were reserved for Israel. The pagans did not enter. If they wanted to receive God's blessings, they had to become Jews. It is in this context to illuminate this difficult ecclesial situation that Matthew introduces this narration, which is not a chronicle but a parable of the ecclesial life of his time. And as we will see, this passage will offer a precious light also for the life of today's communities. The text begins by saying that Jesus forced his disciples to go on the boat. The Greek word used is enarchasen. And it presupposes that there has been resistance from the disciples to carry out the order he had given them. Why were they so reluctant to go on the boat and go to the other shore? What was the objective? What is the other shore? When this expression is found in the gospel, go to the other shore, it, is, it meant to go to the east, to the land where the pagans live where pigs are raised, where there are impure people. And why are they so reluctant? Because it seems that they really don't want to go to the pagans. They have the difficulty in accepting the idea that Christ, the gospel, the proposal of a new world also be made to the pagans. And it is strange that Jesus sends them alone. He does not go with them. Jesus goes to the mountain to pray and then night comes and he is still there praying. Going to the top of the mountain to pray doesn't make much sense. I repeat, we are faced with a parable made up of a biblical images that we will try to decode and then understand the message Matthew wants to give us. The boat into which the disciples enter is clearly the image of the community. The community of these disciples who must enter to challenge the waves of the sea. To go to this land of pagans and bring bread, that is Christ. Second image. This community moves at night, in the dark. In the Bible, Darkness has a pre precise meaning. Let us remember that on the first day of creation, God separated darkness from light and called darkness night and day light. And from that moment, light has always had a positive meaning in the Bible. God is wrapped in light, as in a clock. Darkness is the kingdom of evil, of death, of Sheol, the kingdom of the dead, says the book of Job. It is the land of darkness. It is this darkness that envelops Christian communities from the time of Matthew. And it is a darkness that also envelops the church of today. The third image. The disciples are alone. Jesus left them to go up to the mountain. The mountain is not a material place. It is the world of God, the place where God is found. And Jesus left them because the night came, his day ended, and he went up the mountain. Now we understand what evening it is. It is the end of the life of life that Jesus spent in this world. The text says that he dismissed the crowd, a symbol of all humanity. Jesus ended his day and his mission. Jesus has donated his whole life. He became bread, cured all diseases, and went up the mountain alone. It meant that he has definitely entered the world of God. That is why the disciples are shrouded in darkness and feel alone. Darkness is the image of their disorientation and it is the image of those moments that we also experience today. 
moments in which even those who have a solid faith feel alone, experience the silence of God, so disturbing. Moments when one wonders if the decisions made, the efforts for building, the, building a new world, they still make sense. Especially those moments when one has to deal with the kingdom of darkness, lies, injustices, violence, a world of death that sometimes seems invincible to us and therefore that the commitment to announce the gospel is useless because those doors of the underworld, the doors that Jesus promised that they would not resist the force of the gospel, instead it seems that they are impenetrable. Sometimes this commitment to the kingdom of God is thought to be futile. We are tempted to lower our arms, to get discouraged. These are our nights, nights of doubts, of discouragement, of uncertainty. Now let us hear what happens to the boat that goes to the other shore. The goal that Jesus has indicated to his disciples. Meanwhile, the boat, already a few miles offshore, was being tossed about by the waves, for the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, he came for them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. It is a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. At once, Jesus spoke to them, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. The disciples' boat is in the sea and the waves shake it. The original text here uses the Greek verb basano zomenon that correctly means submit to the test. These are the tests that this boat of the disciples must face. The boat is the church. The basanos was the hardest stone used in Lydia to verify if a metal was gold or if it was a despicable metal. The waves torment almost torture the disciples. These are the inevitable tests that a Christian community must always face. We also experience them today. The waves of the worldliness that offer values that are the opposite of the gospel and they are values behind which everyone runs. Then there are difficulties that arise within the church, the scandals, the hardness of heart to listen to the word, to the word of God, attachment to the outdated traditions that have nothing to do with the gospel. And these tests shake you up, make you suffer but they also reveal where there is the gold of true faith and where instead there is no faith. And some of these waves, let's admit, also throw some out. Those who are a little hesitant to stay in that boat, those who are not very convinced, then there is the turbulent wind, the terrifying wind which is spoken of in the Bible. Psalm 48 speaks of the east wind which breaks the ships of Tarsus. And Psalm 107 says, There is the wind that causes storms in the sea, storms that drag ships to the abysses, and they make sailors tumble like drunkards. The disciples are in this dramatic situation and do not feel the presence of the Master with them. Towards the end of the night, Jesus appears walking on the waves of the sea. The text insists in this walk of Jesus on the waves of the sea. It is mentioned twice. The sea is the symbol of death, of what opposes life. The myths of the ancient Middle East describes the fight of the supreme god of the Mesopotamian pantheon, Morduk, who defeats Iam the sea imagined by people as a monster. 
And this image of the sea as a monster tamed by God, this is also found in Bible. The Lord, however, does not fight as Morduk did, but with his word, he comes and quiets it. God divides the waters and the book of Job says that God turns to the sea and says, you will not go beyond this. Here is where your proud waves must halt. If we consider this symbolism, we will understand the fear of the disciples. It is not the fear they have of the lake of Tiberias, which they knew very well. And they were also expert swimmers. In any case, it was perhaps Jesus who could not swim because he was born in the mountains of Lower Galilee. But the apostles are people used to swimming on the lake of Tiberias. Here, we are in, the, in front of a parable. Jesus is one who walks on the waves of the sea. He is not afraid of being swallowed by the sea. He can no longer be swallowed because he has already overcome death. What is the fear of man? In the end, it is one, that of being swallowed forever by the whirlpools of death. The psalmist recounts the tragedy he suffered when he was beaten from a serious illness and says in Psalm 18, The waves of death surround me. The currents of hell overwhelm me. The waves of the sea. It uses precisely the image of the waves that were about to swallow him. Now Jesus appears. We had said, that he was on the mountain. He is in the world of God, while the disciples are in the boat and must carry out the task that Jesus has entrusted to them. That is to take him, that is Jesus, and take the bread that is him, the gospel. Jesus walks on water. Death has no power over him because he has divine life. He went through the biological death but biological death has no power over the life of God. This is the meaning of the, this image of walking on water. Furthermore, in the book of Job it is said, only God walks on the waves of the sea, because death has no power over the life of God. The disciples do not recognize him. They think they are seeing a ghost. How come they don't recognize Jesus? We are not before a chronicle, but before a page of theology. Matthew is describing, with biblical language, the anguished situation of the Christian communities of his time. The evangelist wants to enlighten them. Jesus is always by their side, every day, until the end of the world, as promised. Not physically present, like when he walked with them on the roads of Palestine, he is present in a different way, but they might confuse him with a ghost. It is the same image that is used on Easter day. The frightened and amazed disciples believed they had seen a ghost. It is not easy to be aware of the presence of the risen one in the Christian community. It is only recognizable with the eyes of faith. Even today, we wonder if the Christ in whom we believe, perhaps he is not just a ghost. We don't really feel him by our side in moments of joy, of pain. And how many times we do consult him when we have to make demanding decisions in our life? Maybe sometimes he is just a ghost for us too. Do we really believe that he is risen and that he walks on the waters of death? And if yes, then the question arises spontaneously. Could not his divine force also communicate with us, allowing us to walk over the waters of death? That is to say, could he not also communicate to us that divine life that he possesses so that we are not swallowed by the vortex of death. 
Matthew answers this question. He is the only one among the evangelists by presenting a dialogue between Jesus and Peter. Let us hear it. Peter said to him in reply, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. Peter got out of the boat and began to walk on the water towards Jesus. But when he saw how strong the wind was, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught Peter and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? After they got into the boat, the wind died down. Those who were in the boat did him homage, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Peter's question is a bit strange, isn't it? By the way, it is unlikely that Peter be afraid of facing the lake of Tiberias. He is an expert swimmer. And these questions are only asked by those who do not understand the symbolic meaning of the entire narrative. We are before a parable. Peter does not fear the waters of Lake Tiberias, but he fears the waves of the sea of death. He is afraid, sinking, but he would like to be in the same condition as Jesus who walks on the waves of this sea without sinking. The master invites him to go to him, that is, he asks him to get to where he is and walk on the waves of the sea without sinking, doing what he has done, that is, the choice of the gift of life. And Peter accepts it, goes to the master, but then he begins to question the decision he has made to go to the master, to donate his life. It scares him and at some point he thinks he can't do it and asks the Lord to communicate to him Jesus' own strength. And as long as he keeps his eye on the master, on what he has done, Peter manages to go to him. But when his faith decreases, when he begins to doubt of the choice he has made, he sings. He is afraid of drowning. That is, begins to think that donating his life means losing it. And then the thought returns that perhaps it is better to live like everyone else. Save your life for yourself. Enjoy it a little. And that's about it. Not looking for anything more. But it is precisely this choice that makes us think, if we save life for ourselves, we lose it. To preserve it, to challenge the waves of death, we must give it. Peter is the image of our condition as uncertain disciples, wavering disciples. We believe in Christ, but only a little. Then we go back and think. The doubt that assails us is not that Jesus is not the successful man, is that the gift of life for love is not a worthy choice. It's worth doing. The question is, I follow Jesus or I don't follow him. And this doubt, Jesus says, it is the sign of your little faith. You trust me? but only a little. That's why you are afraid. Let us get back to the boat with Jesus. Peter got out of the boat. This is not to be done because if one gets out of the boat of the church, that person is alone. He or she sinks. But when Jesus is welcomed onto the boat, all the winds come down. The church today, including our personal lives, is always shaken by the waves. How do you calm these waves? Let the gospel enter your life, the life of the church, and the waves calm down. 
Let the Eucharistic bread enter your life, in the life of the Church. An authentic Eucharist, not a hypocritical one. A Eucharist that represents the link with committed life. And then the waves calm down. I wish you a good Sunday and a good week.